All right, we'll, we'll kick this off. Uh, my name is Major Noel Siosin. Um, I'm the Deputy Director of the Modern War Institute. I'd first like to thank you for uh, giving up your time to attend uh, this wonderful, wonderful uh, panel where we'll discuss urban warfare, counterterrorism, Southeast Asia, and more specifically, uh, the siege of Marawi. Um, for those of you viewing this video online, uh, I would like to thank the Koch Foundation uh, who sponsored this event um, in, in our effort to help educate both the cadets here at West Point uh, and the staff and faculty. So, without further ado, I'd actually like to do a little icebreaker video. Uh, and the purpose of my video is really to kind of set the mood so that you feel comfortable asking questions uh, for the in individuals to your front. So this video is a very short scene from Marawi, and it's a thug life video. So, again, Im important for you to get an understanding of the environment that we're talking about. Um, and very shortly, I'll, I'll introduce our phenomenal speakers. Um, but please do, I, I encourage you to, to, as you're listening to the, the, each individual brief, come up with those questions. Don't shy away from, uh, from those tough questions that are burning on your brain. I promise you, all three of them, myself included, are uh, impeccable and consummate professionals, especially those three, uh, and they'll be frank in answering your questions. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to John Spencer, uh, fellow MWI colleague, uh, urban war chair for MWI, uh, former armor officer with a notable deployment in Sadr City, uh, and internationally recognized when it comes to uh, discussing urban war. Uh, to his left, uh, to your right, is Major Cole Livia Ratos, uh, for also former armor officer, uh, graduate from West Point. Uh, following his time in, in the armor community, he transitioned to become a PSYOP officer, uh, and he has a deployment in the Philippines as well. Uh, he currently serves within the Department of Strategic Studies uh, as a course director. Uh, and then finally, but certainly not least, uh, on, the f on your far right is uh, Undersecretary, now Lieutenant General retired Danilo Pomonig, uh, who is the um, hero of the Zamboanga siege uh, a few years back, but most recently the ground force commander in the siege of Marawi. Uh, also commanded uh, within special operations in the Philippines, uh, most notably Special Operations Command uh, and their special mission unit. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. John Spencer. I would Thank you. So, like uh, Noel said, I'm John Spencer. I'm the chair of Urban Warfare Studies here at MWI. I'm really happy to be back. Uh, I have a short amount of time, so I'll get right into it and go into how do we define what urban warfare is. Next slide, Noel. Um, so, if you say urban warfare, let's let's make sure words that matter. And, and when we say that, we're talking about a certain context. I study urban operations in general, and you know, urban operations can be across a range of of military operations, everything from HADR or humanitarian assistance up to counterinsurgencies to full-out high-intensity combat. Um, and militaries, in general, do not have a long history of urban combat. We have a long history of fighting for cities, not in cities. Even if you look at what we carry forward as our kind of quintessential historical battles, like the Battle of Stalingrad, most of the fighting happened on the outside of Stalingrad. But we all want to talk about that, com that complex, close combat fight, which, which is what I want to talk about. Um, urban warfare used to be where warfare started, if you talk about siege warfare. But let's talk about the modern battlefield. So we, all, we are a historical animal. Our armies are. And we do carry forward uh, ways of fighting. Um, since urban 
warfare has a definition of, we're talking about the actual execution of fighting, trying to impose our will on the enemy, usually through force. Um, we have a history of that, and we carry forward certain battles. Prior to World War II, you know, maneuver warfare, trench warfare, is an evolution of warfare, and it wasn't until World War II that we actually saw some deep-held city fighting, um, and, although it was limited there. So if you look at my slide, I have along this spectrum of combat, everything from total war, um, which is you know, combat in cities with no restrictions. And that's really why Stalingrad remains a pivotal battle that we can continue to carry forward, because it is a great example of two militaries fighting it out almost unlimitedly um, against each other and, and, and the complexities that sh can cause for each side trying to win a battle. Um, there are other wars of, or battles of World War II that we carry forward as a U.S. military, as a Western military adhering to the laws of armed conflict and trying to <laughs> clear a city. If you look at that slide, we fought the Battle of Aachen, we fought the Battle of Manila, the Battle of Seoul, okay, and then World War II ends. <laughs> I do not. All right. Um, so after the... <laughs> so you, get, you fast forward, if you look at, at the end of World War II, when do we, the U.S. military, fight in the urban combat again? You look at the Battle of Wei, um, Mogadishu, um, but something happened in the evolution of warfare in non-wars was that the age of the urban guerrilla, the age of the urban terrorists, and after the failed Munich raid of 1972, it changed all militaries' views towards urban combat to be focused on counterinsurgency, counterterrorism. Um, after that failed raid, everybody stood up counterterrorist units, Delta, Special Forces, German SGS, all of them. And this tactic of entering clear a room, the high risk intelligence driven raids um, evolved from these special units into the general purpose force. And that's what you saw the military preparing for for urban combat. But now we've, we've entered a new period of urban warfare, which I call, go to the next slide, um, the age of siege warfare. Um, now you have non-state actors not using guerrilla tactics to um, survive within urban areas. Um, they form more paramilitary force uh, and seize urban terrain and then tell you to come take it from them. Um, that hasn't happened since the Battle of Way. Then you have a couple offsuits in our experience in Iraq, which was str almost strictly counterinsurgency and counterterrorist outside of a few pitched battles like the Battle of Fallujah, where an enemy takes control of urban terrain and says, come take it from me. That is a different type of urban warfare. But now if you look at this slide, although I don't like putting words on slides, it's happened a lot more in the last 10 years because of the success it can give a non-state actor to get into an urban terrain, hold it, and then say, come take it from me. And because of certain reasons, if I want to take it from them, no matter what type of military, it may have involved destroying your city to save it, which is a classic term from Vietnam. Um, next slide. So let's talk about the modern challenges of urban warfare. Um, I argue and I have argued that urban warfare, again, if we get straight on definitions, is the most difficult warfare that you can engage in. Basically, it's the most difficult environment. And some people would argue that maybe jungle warfare is just as hard. That, that's for, and the reason I think that's not true is one, Urban, by definition, means three things. Physical structures, populations, and infrastructures to support those populations. You gotta have those three things in order to have an urban environment. So to have urban warfare, you gotta have, engage in an urban terrain. Um, the, the physical terrain has changed across, it's just changed in time. So no longer do you have just strictly mud houses in urban terrain, you have rebar reinforced concrete. Uh, it's really hard to penetrate that as a military. You've got to have some high explosive force to penetrate a concrete rebar reinforced structure. And in the last 10 years, many militaries have faced what it actually takes to penetrate that concrete building. 
And when you actually penetrate it with the precision guided munition, all you do is create a bunker proof or a, you know, basically a bunker for that person. There are already bunkers. So that's the analogy of an urban jungle, is that every building becomes a bunker that you must attack a bunker, um, which is its own military process. Um, whether it's any battle, Aleppo, Raqqa, Mosul, I won't talk about Marwari, when we use high explosives to attack an enemy within a building, most of the time we don't engage, we don't get him or her. Um, we just create rubble, which then makes it more difficult. Or we create a bunker, which they, can, they just go back into because they've dug tunnels between each building, which is classic urban warfare history when we talk about high intensity fights. So when I say urban warfare today, I'm talking about a mission to attack a city from an enemy that has besieged himself within it, and you got to seize or clear it. I just got back from NTC last week, and that is the, one of the missions that you'll fight at NTC if you ever go, is attack a city to clear an enemy who has besieged it, which along the, the top of my slide, it shows you the classic steps of that on a, a bigger scale. So we talked about the physical training creates a challenge, but now you have people inside the So no matter what, a Western law of armed conflict military will have to account for the civilians there and constrain their force, whether that's um, proportionality, discrimination, all the laws, which makes your use and options of force more limited because you have to assume there are civilian populations there. Despite the fact that almost every one of these battles I'm, I talked about in that first slide, we make an attempt to clear the population. Um, and we'll usually, if we do take enough time, clear 90% of the population out. Well, if you're talking about a city of 300,000 or a million, that still leaves 3,000, 9,000, 10,000 civilians that you are now going to implement force on and you have to protect, which now the trend is to keep peop as many people, the enemy wants to keep as many people as they can in the city to further constrain your ability to clear the city. So some of those are the constraints. Well, on the other side of this slide, you have kind of the capabilities that you might have. This operation, this operation to, see, to clear a city or seize it back from an enemy is a combined arms fight. Many militaries across history have found out how hard it is to do it without mobile protective firepower or if they just send tanks in without infantry. You have to have the whole gamut. Um, and some militaries just don't have that or they're, they're under-trained in that. And that's even the US military. If we're going to attack a city like this to conduct an operation, you're going to surround the city, which is called the isolation phase. And then you're going to penetrate the defenses with a combined arms breach. You're going to use attack aviation if you can. But these non-state actors only need a couple things in order to make this the toughest fight that any military will ever face. They need snipers, small arms fire. They need guerrilla tactics, ambushes. Lots of IEDs, and we're talking houseborn IEDs on every house of every interest because they know the enter and clear the room tactic. So there's, and then they need RPGs because an RPG can penetrate every type of armor we have except an M1 Abrams. That's all they got to do to contend against national level militaries. And that's what they do. So we have to use this combined arms breach. And I, I'm probably cl closing on my time. I love to talk about this stuff in, in aviation. If you look at this tactic, even if the world's best military does it, because of the capabilities we are currently designed to do, when I penetrate into a urban area, it's going to be very explosive. Let's say I just do that to get into the city. Well, if I want to clear an enemy out, I have to be able to find out where he is. Most of the time, I'm going to do that by movement to contact. I'm literally going to drive down a street, and if I take fire, then I'm going to attack that position. Because other than that, I can't see inside buildings. So I'm literally walking into ambushes most of the time, hoping that my tactics have created a certain amount of survivability that I can back up a little bit and then attack the building. If I attack a building, I have to have munitions that can penetrate it. My small arms don't penetrate concrete, no matter what you might think. Even 50 cal, 25 millimeter, it's going to have a hard time penetrating concrete. So if you're the defender, which Kozlowicz teaches us is the most, the strongest uh, position, if you're the defender, they gotta have a way to penetrate me inside these bunkers. So usually what happens is that most militaries will start, and that's US military specifically, will start the operation by clearing along an avenue of approach, house by house, stacking on the door, and then entering a building until they find enemy. 
um, that quickly goes to the wayside because they, that's pretty easy to combat. So what ends up happening is that the enemy establishes himself in a strong point of every building. And you can't get into it, so you have to penetrate it with high explosives. So then you see the destructive power of putting fire down um, onto the building. And that's where you get a really building to building to building fight that is a repetition of attack of a strong point um, because of the capabilities that we currently have, even in the most advanced military in the world. Um, this gives such an advantage to the defender that it's off the charts. Um, you can get better at it with combined arms maneuver using mobile protected firepower and artillery, and, and you'll get better, and all armies do as the fight progresses, but sometimes there's a heavy tax to pay up front. I think with, with that, I'll transition. All right. John, thank you very much. Um, so what I'd like to call out to the audience right now is, as, as you look up there on the slide, um, pay specific attention to the challenges on the left. Uh, so as I continue the story and I transition to Cole and, and Sir Pomoneg, uh, there will be plenty, there should be plenty of discussion uh, and maybe even questioning and, and criticism uh, when it comes to the challenges. So uh, at this point, I'd like to transition from a, a pretty fantastic broad overview which sets the stage uh, and I'll start to scope us down to the Philippines where we'll discuss counterterrorism, uh, specifically in an urban setting. So for those of you unfamiliar with the Philippines, it is located Southeast Asia. What you see up there uh, is the map itself proper, more specifically Marawi. So that yellow portion uh, is known as the Southern Geographic Area of the Philippines, Mindanao. The middle portion where it's just below the word Philippines, those are the Visayas. Uh, and then from the Philippines and North, where you see Manila, that's Luzon. Important for you to understand as we, just, as we tell this story, uh, that each area is home to multiple ethnic groups and multiple languages. Uh, so there's a challenge already presented to the government uh, in terms of uh, exercising uh, the capabilities inherent uh, with providing uh, education, uh, resources, security, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so with respect to the terrorist infiltration, how did we get to Marawi itself. Uh, as you can see depicted above, there's a lot of external influence when it comes to those insurgents and specifically the terrorists. You see the Philippines on the, on the top, on the left side of the picture, but to the top right. Notably, you have Malaysia and Indonesia. The border, um, the southwest border of the Philippines, which is that archipelago um, in Mindanao, is very porous. It's, it's difficult to provide security and maintain order in a country of over 7,000 islands. Uh, so that is the dilemma posed to the armed forces of the Philippines uh, and the government of the Philippines writ large. To the right, now we're drilling down to Islamic State specifically. So Sabah is uh, in, in Indonesia, it's on uh, the Indonesia, Malaysia, kind of part of land in Southeast Asia. And it is very, very, um, conducive uh, if you would like to provide facilitation for the armed groups, armed militant groups uh, that are pursuing their objectives uh, in Mindanao. Um, so the takeaway from this slide for you all uh, is that even though the Philippines is a sovereign country, they have a very legitimate uh, armed forces or security forces writ large, it's still very difficult for them to uh, completely prevent any sort of um, pursuit of sanctuary uh, within their southern lands. All right, so I'm going to fast forward now to Marawi so that we don't take up too much of your time and allow you the opportunity to ask questions. Every single person you see on that slide uh, was a senior leader, or what you are all familiar with labeling as an HVI or an HVT. So they're high value. Uh, to the far left is Dr. Mahmoud. Um, he was the facilitator, primarily financial. He was the connection uh, between ISIS Maine in the Middle East and then uh, ISIS East Asia, where the individual to his right, Isnilan Haqlan, was named as the Emir, named and recognized. 
um, recognized to the point that he was also included in an article in uh, ISIS uh, periodical that they, they spread out as propaganda around the world. The four individuals to the right are the Maute group. Uh, they are four of seven brothers, um, highly educated, highly resourced, uh, trained in the Middle East, both uh, in terms of combat training, but more importantly, education, higher level education. Uh, they are the local group within Marawi. They have phenomenal uh, family ties, uh, and I actually have as a surprise uh, for the speakers and, and for MWI. We have in our midst uh, a cadet who lived in Marawi for three years. So uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Jay. Uh, if you could very quickly describe the, the normal day-to-day -day with respect to violence, and then please also touch on uh, Rido and um, kind of that uh, familial violence against each other. Yeah, I'm uh, Jason Cadet Penaflor. I studied in uh, MSU, Mindanao State University, located in Marawi City. So to touch on the violence that happens there every day, just last two weeks ago, a student in MSU was killed. Uh, it was his, he's a Christian and he has a relationship with uh, one of the Maranaos. It's one of the ethnic groups that lives there. And they don't like that. They are so protective with their uh, families. So they don't like uh, other ethnic groups uh, having relationship with their own. So they killed this guy, this student, uh, 20 years old uh, student in MSU. So that's a normal thing. You could hear gunshots everywhere going to school. It's a normal thing. Um, Rido is a, uh, it's a familial, uh, like, it's a tribal war, but instead of tribes, it's within uh, families, because they are really uh, so, uh, protective of their families. If you touch one of their family, uh, they will uh, retaliate with you. And uh, because of this uh, thing, uh, families in Marawi lives in a compound together, and their houses have tunnels so that if one of the, uh, of the houses in their compounds is attacked, they can just go into the tunnel and then uh, protect their own. So that's how uh, the families lived in Marawi City. Sir? Thank you, Jay. So that's important for you to recognize uh, as I transition over to Cole, uh, who was there on the ground in 15 and 16 during the drawdown of uh, America's technical assistance, uh, but also kind of that fomenting of the disparate groups as they started to coalesce under one flag of ISIS. Uh, so that Rido, um, the way Jade described it, imagine your house, as John mentioned, reinforced with rebar, but it is constructed for the purpose of fighting. And, and not fighting like verbal fighting and the American dysfunction that we're all colloquially familiar with. I'm talking about uh, what America would consider gang warfare, but that's normal from block to block. Um, and, and so with that, without further ado, uh, I'm happy to turn it over to Cole. All right, thanks Noel. Uh, as Noel said, I was in the Philippines as part of the Special Operations Task Force. Uh, the group I was a part of was called the Pacific Command Augmentation Team. We were just transitioning away from Jesotif P, the Joint Special Operations Task Force Philippines. In 2015, that was kind of shutting down, and they were trying to bring the levels of US troops down. Um, this is actually a really good transition. So my background is uh, from psychological operations. I'm a PSYOP officer, um, and I was in the Philippines essentially to try and limit radicalization and recruitment by some of the uh, key militant groups that we saw. So one of the important things to understand about the militant groups in the Philippines, they kind of come in three different uh, groupings. The first set is essentially communist insurgents that's seeking to capture the government and establish a communist state. The second one are Islamist separatists, mainly in the southern Philippines, whose main goal is to establish kind of a sovereign state within Mindanao and break away from the central Philippine government. This third group, though, the third group is kind of more what we would consider transnational terrorists. That includes the Maute group that you saw earlier, um, that includes Abu Sayyaf, uh, and several other groups that have kind of come together since around 2014 mm. or 2015, when ISIS really started to have some influence in the region. Um, so one of my jobs, if you can kind of think of ISIS's transnational kind of terrorist model, you can almost think of it as a franchise. 
It's a franchise model, right? Like the headquarters of ISIS or the main center of ISIS, being in the Middle East, being in Syria, that's where the base of their power is. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to kind of export their influence to other militant groups that might align with their ideology and kind of buy into that franchise, take on their marketing, take on their motto, take on the black flag. And so when I was there in 2015, this is what we started to see happening with ISIS. Um, one of the main areas this happened, as, uh, as you just pointed out, was on college campuses. So our job was to try and kind of identify where are these sources of radicalization and recruitment happening, and how can we actually prevent that to hopefully, you know, we had no idea that morality was gonna happen, you know, in the way that it did, but we kind of could get the idea early on that um, ISIS was starting to create a much bigger and bigger appeal in the southern Philippines and try and kind of break those ties and prevent that appeal early on. Unfortunately, because of the timing, uh, you, you have to think about this in terms of the context of what was going on globally also. This is when ISIS was kind of ramping up in Iraq, in Syria, so the majority of U.S. efforts kind of turned to the Middle East, where you know, the bigger efforts had been all along, but we saw the main ISIS threat as emerging from the Middle East. So what we kind of did is continue to ramp down operations in the Philippines and really deprioritize uh, even things like countering radicalization and countering recruitment. Um, I think you know, there were certainly signs early on uh, that ISIS was gaining appeal and kind of gaining steam, and the real danger of that was because within that third category of militant groups, these kind of transnational um, Islamist or terrorist groups, they had kind of operated somewhat independently before. There may have been some ties between them, especially at low levels, but up until that point, they hadn't really come together under one single banner and really kind of shared TTP, shared resources, shared knowledge. We were kind of trying to do everything we could to prevent that from happening, but a lot of it was just a resource issue and a lot of it was an attention issue. You know, the, the U.S. Um, kind of Special Operations Command, Pacific Command, was kind of unable to uh, really prioritize those efforts in light of, you know, where we put the focus on kind of the main headquarters and the main hub of ISIS being from Syria. So, you know, unfortunately, that ended up setting, setting up a series of very consequential and kind of very negative events in Mindanao. Um, but one of the key things we should keep in mind, even though, um, as General Pomona will talk, it was kind of an operational and a tactical success retaking Marawi from ISIS. If we think about where we are strategically right now, the levels of ISIS or ISIS affiliated groups in the Philippines are somewhat stable, if not still continuing to grow a little bit. So when we talk about kind of priority of efforts, resourcing, um, where some of these main you know, focuses and main efforts should be from the US, we really have to keep in mind, you know, what do we care about when it comes to grand strategy and our strategic outlook as opposed to just kind of looking at each of these individual events from a tactical or an operational perspective. So I think that, that should hopefully paint the picture and kind of set up what was going on the, on the ground you know, for a few years before uh, these ISIS affiliated groups and the Maute group was kind of able to siege Marawi. Awesome, thank you very much. So um, what you see up there yes, uh, is essentially, that's, that's the, <clears throat> with some degree of specificity, uh, those are the hard numbers that represent the groups that Cole uh, basically tracked while he was there and, and provided warning against. To the left, and I'll play this video. This video, and, and this will allow me to transition to, uh, to General Pomonig. This video was captured on the raid on May 23rd. It shows the faces of those individuals I had on the prior slide. So you have Hapalon in, on there, Maute group. And very so shortly, you'll see a zoom in of Marawi City itself as they develop their Kana. This video basically corroborated a lot of the intelligence that we were starting to see, both in the interagency with our partners in the Armed Forces of the Philippines and then as well on the U.S. side. Um, and that, that validated Cole's concern 
uh, that these groups were now preparing to take hold of the city in the same manner that, that John mentioned. Uh, so without further ado, hmm. uh, I definitely want to introduce General Plamonig. I was fortunate enough to meet him uh, when he was a lieutenant colonel, uh, and I was a brand new, right out of the SFQ course captain. Uh, he is obviously now an undersecretary, and I'm only a major. Um, so I feel like I was successful uh, as I served uh, in the capacity of what we called at the time the Liaison Coordination Element, or LCE. Uh, so underneath that banner, I was able to uh, extend resources from the U.S. Uh, during OEFP um, as he basically pursued the insurgent groups that we just talked about. <clears throat> uh, and then most recently, I was, I was fortunate enough to, to go back to the Philippines uh, where he was the SOCOM commander, um, and I, I was able to, again, provide that support on behalf of the U.S. as he prosecuted uh, the siege of Marawi. So, sir? Thank you very much, uh, Noel. I would like to start by saying one of the most significant transformations we had in the Philippines in the past few years was uh, in the security landscape was the shift from uh, rural operations to urban operations, where uh, fighting was brought in urban centers and uh, populated areas. My discussion will be focused more on the tactical aspect, what really transpired during Marawi on the ground. Okay. Now, we have uh, used the following strategy. First one, immediately at the outbreak of uh, Marawi siege, President Duterte declared martial law in the whole province, or in the whole island of Pindanao. And uh, martial law enabled us to control the movement of firearms, the movement of resources, and the movement of, 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 of uh, fighters from and within the battle area. Also, the uh, martial law enabled us to arrest and detain those who are directly supporting the terrorists or conspicuously supporting the terrorists so that the uh, flow of supplies was cut. And lastly, martial law enabled us to prevent the spillover, the spillover of chaos from the adjacent uh, uh, adjacent communities. Now, after Master, no? uh, next, we have used the hard power approach. So, what is this uh, hard power approach? It is the use of uh, military might, our military arsenal, and uh, immediately we organized the Joint Task Force Marawi. This is a military component that contains the threat within the main battle area. Along with this, we have uh, direct action operations whose purpose is uh, to rescue the innocent uh, hostages and, of course, the physical destructions of uh, the terrorists in the main battle area. In conjunction with the hard power is uh, the soft power approach. This one is very important. We may have, we may have uh, uh, won the battle, but uh, we can also be losing the war without the support of the uh, people. So we have used the soft power approach. Soft power approach is uh, the conduct of uh, civil military activities. While our forces in the main battle area are pulling their triggers, those forces at the controlled adjacent areas are conducting civil military operations. These are in the form of uh, information operations, in the form of interagency operations, talking with their imams. And with this uh, soft, soft power approach, we, will able to, we were able to win the support and the trust of the people. We were able to win their hearts and minds and uh, we were able to prevent the uh, disinformation campaign of the uh, enemies and, of course, the black pro propaganda. But uh, more than anything else, the uh, 
soft power approach legitimized our operations. That is the most important because we felt at the time that the people are behind us. So that's why uh, we at the main battleground added much strength because we felt the support of the people. Next is the whole of nation approach. We told our people that we cannot do it alone. Military could not do it alone. That's why we harnessed the uh, all government instrument, instrumentalities and agencies uh, to join the fight. They may not be joining the fight physically, but they are supporting us. Like uh, there were so many private doctors offered their help for our wounded uh, companions. Uh, their hospitals are open for our uh, uh, wounded soldiers. They offer their buses from the airport going to Marawi City, which will take two to three hours. These are the things, no? so that uh, uh, all instrumentalities of the national government were used, and it seemed to be that they are part of this campaign. They are part of the battle. Next. Now, uh, winning the war, winning Battle of Marawi did not come very easy to us. We have faced a host of problems and challenges. And these are, number one, the uh, Battle of uh, Marawi exposed the uh, complexities of uh, urban, wave, urban warfare. You know? uh, it tested the capability of the uh, Philippine security uh, uh, force who were trained primarily from rural operations to urban operations. So you could imagine we've been fighting insurgency for almost five decades. You know? So that our operations is geared on rural operations. So from the thick forest jungle in the mountain, now we head towards a thickly populated and dense uh, areas. And we have to adapt very quickly. You know, you know what happened during, during the siege of Marawi? Some of our people fighting in the front at the main battle area. But large portion at the back are conducting trust training because they don't have any idea how ur urban operations uh, would take place. So that we, we, con we, we conducted uh, two-week trust training for them to know the basic skills of uh, urban warfare, like street-to-street uh, -street -street fighting, black-to-black -black, uh, -black firing, and house-to-house uh, -house, uh, clearing. You know? Next is uh, alliances between the local terrorist group and the foreign terrorist fighter. You know, I had the uh, opportunity to become ground commander also during Sambuanga siege. That was uh, sometime September 2003. And uh, I must tell you that uh, I have never seen such kind of enhanced skills and capability than the one I saw in Marawi. It is because there were foreign terrorist fighters who came from, who came from the Middle East and joining the fight. You know? So indeed, the uh, presence of foreign, foreign terrorist fighters enabled them to share their experience, their experiences in Mosul, their experiences in, in uh, Aleppo. You know? uh, uh, giving more sophisticated firearms. You know? During the Battle of Marawi, they have extensively used IEDs. You know? Almost they belted the cities with uh, IEDs. They have drones, you know? drones hovering the sky to determine our locations and our activities, and using interconnected tunnels. These are the things that I had never seen before during our previous conflict. You know? So that's why uh, the presence of the foreign terrorist fighter makes, makes the fighting in Marawi more challenging and difficult. And there is one thing that I have observed very keenly during the Battle of Marawi. The enemy seemed to become more brutal 
and more barbaric. You know. Why did I say that? Because uh, they have decapitated our soldiers. They torched and burned our soldiers. Some of the women were raped by them. You know. It is beyond the, uh, the imagination of human compassion. You know. Next is radicalization is taking place everywhere. While fighting is ongoing on at the main battle area, radicalization is going on. At the start of Marawi siege, there were only 600, along 600 plus uh, terrorist groups who fought with us. But every day, their numbers are increasing. You know why? They released all the prisoners and converted them transform them into fighters. Some of the hostages, you know, uh, they will be subject to de facto challenge or religious test should they fail to recite the uh, scriptures so they may be placed in a very bad situation. So they converted them. They have no choice. Either you join us, terrorists, or you shall be killed. You know. Also, women, you know, so... Some of the uh, women, hostages, because of uh, the long battle, almost 156 days, developed what we call emotional intimacy between the hostages and the hostage uh, takers. And uh, that is a form of radicalization. That's why at the end of the battle, we had have all, we have killed almost 1,000, 1,000 terrorist fighters, because radicalization is uh, taking place while Battle of Marawi is uh, ensuing. No? Next is uh, humanitarian crisis. No? Indeed, the Battle of Marawi caused uh, humanitarian crisis. It displaced some 400,000 innocent civilians and left 1,000 lives uh, killed. But more than anything else, all the structures there were, uh, all the structures there were uh, damaged. While it's true that uh, we have we have killed, neutralized the enemies, and uh, raised our flag there, you know, but the, for me the two prizes of uh, winning the battle are these uh, innocent civilians who displaced from their homes, whose dreams were shattered and whose hopes were uh, destroyed. You know. Worse is that their uh, conditions in the evacuation centers, these IDPs, 400,000 of them who left Marawi, are now at the different evacuation centers. You know. So they have to endure the worst condition of the evacuation center, the illnesses, you know, the contagious disease, and uh, that's one of the uh, concern of the president now because, uh, of course, uh, they are sub subjected to agitation and radicalization. You know? Now, money trail. Indeed, there was a surge of local remittance in northern Mindanao where Marawi is located. Devoid of financial planning, they would have not sustained the five months of uh, five months of fighting. The data shows that comparing 2015 and 2016 uh, local remittances, you know, in 2017, remittances by value increases by 200 to 400 percent. Not only that, remittance centers also mushroom in uh, northern Mindanao, especially in, especially in uh, Marawi City. So those are indicators that uh, monies are flowing in to sustain the fight. You know? And the terrorists need that. So for every day, for every day of sustaining the fighting, they are getting paid. They are getting remunerated. You know, there was uh, one commonality I observed to those whom we killed during the battlefield. All of them possess a 30,000 pesos. 
30,000 pesos is something like $600. They were the recruits, new recruits came out. So the moment they joined, they said, yes, I will join you. They will be given $600. And the moment they set their feet at the main battle area, they will be given another $1,400. While their families are receiving some $1,000 to $2,000. So this is the kind of, uh, this is the kind uh, of mo how money flows during the, uh, during the uh, Marawi seed. As I mentioned, Marawi is a poor province. So they could be easily lured by uh, financial remuneration. Next is uh, rehabilitation and reconstructions and rebuilding. As I mentioned earlier, one of the main concerns of the president, other, otherwise, you know, two years after Marawi, main battle area still seemed like a ghost town. So that evacuees or those IDPs at the evacuation center could still never come back to the main battle area. These are their houses. Why? Because uh, there are still plenty of IEDs. There are still plenty of uh, unexplosive ordnance devices that are yet to be found at the main battle area. Now, because of this, these this IDPs you know, at the evacuation center could easily be radicalized. Hence, uh, we are doing everything to fast track the rehabilitations and reconstruction. So those are the challenges. Now, uh, the following slide seems to be very unconventional to you when you see it, but uh, it really did happen. You know. A country like ours, Philippines, you know, we do not have the sophistication of uh, firearms equipment. You know. But uh, I must tell you that uh, boys had a lot of initiative and ingenuity. And I would like to show you some of the uh, initiative innovations that we did during the Marawi. And this is a, a, uh, one aspect that brought success to uh, liberation of Marawi. First one is the use of, uh, of uh, 105. I think everybody is familiar how to use the 105. 105 is created as an indirect weapon when you fire the enemy uh, within the range of uh, 12 kilometers. But this time, I will ask you, how would you use your 105 if you are fighting enemies just at your front at a distance of 100 or 150 meters. Can you use your 105 publisher? Now, as you could see there, the tube is almost parallel in the ground. The 105 became a direct weapon for us. Otherwise, it would become irrelevant. It would be useless because that is an indirect uh, weapon. But situation calls that we have to fight them at 100 meters. So how do we make the 105 useful to us? So converting them into a direct weapon. No? Uh, there, there are plenty of like, like this, a uh, noodle soup during the course of Parawi. We cut the bottom size and then we put a rope or thread. No? So you put it in front of the turret and then peep at the bridge. So you see this, this uh, cross, crosshair. So sight your target and then align the crosshair. And I would tell you, you would hit your mark. You would hit your target. Hundreds of rounds I have used this one and it really, really worked well. There was one good story I would share to you. you know? The uh, regiment commander of field artillery, he is a one star. He is the uh, head of the artillery divisions we had. He went to Marawi and I asked him uh, why did he visit us. You know, you know his answer. I came here just to see how, 
how uh, direct uh, 105 weapon can be used. He has been in the service for 38 years as artillery officer, but he had never tried this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, of uh, direct uh, weapon. So with that, we were able to use our uh, 105. Next, second is uh, just like 105. No? There were so many in urban operations, enemies will tend to block the roads. Otherwise, there were plenty of debris and rubbles, which, will, which would paralyze your armors. During that time, I have 72 armors given to me. But because the streets are filled of rubbles and debris, I can no longer use them. So how to make that armor relevant? So we have to place it, we have to place it uh, at the second floor or the third floor of the building. And how, how, did we use, how did we do that? Next. See, we have constructed, uh, what do you call this? Ramp. No? So it takes us, uh, take us weeks, no? but uh, truly it served the purpose. Now we can use our armor. No? I am showing you this because in the absence of capability, there are still options you could use just be innovative, just be resourceful. That's, that's the clear message. Next, ingenuity. No? We, cannot, we could not throw our grenades at the third, third level of the building or the fourth level of the building. So we have to use Angry Bird. That is a giant sling. No? It looks funny, gentlemen, but I tell you, it's uh, worthy. No? So we place the grenade inside the... Uh, Inside the glass, we pull out the lever, and then we use this one. So uh, it could be thrown in second floor, third floors. Next. And the last one is uh, one of the most uh, challenging part that we had. It took us several weeks to do this. And that is crossing, crossing a 100-meter uh, kill zone. The situation was the enemy snipers were there at Par North. NEP snipers and, uh, and so many dozens of uh, enemies waiting, waiting for our soldiers to, uh, to push. No? Soldiers are here at the sound. So how would you be able to cross this while uh, enemy snipers are waiting for you? Again, by sheer of uh, resourcefulness, we have uh, created the... Uh, we call it Great Wall of uh, Marawi. No? So sandbags, every night we, we put the soil and then put it in a sandbag and then push it inch by inch. No? It, I know it took us about three weeks to do this, but the thing is it connected us. No? It, that one is a vital ground. No? They would not, enemies would not want to lose that because that is a vital ground for them. See? Next. Yes, next one. So that's how it looks like. There is a, there is a, there is a hole there, and then we pass it. You know. So in the absence of capabilities, uh, resource, resourcefulness, and innovations would, uh, would work. Also, to bring the message across to uh, the main battle area, whether you are enemies or hostages, we attach megaphones at the armors and roll them, roll them down to the main battle area. We also have uh, dropping of um, water bottles. The water bottle contains instructions, instruction for the enemies, should they want to surrender, what they would do is all indicated there, and instruction also for hostages. If in case uh, they got a hold of this, then there was instruction to, to do that. There, is a, uh, there are cell phone numbers and safe place where they could go. Yes, yes. And of course, uh, uh, support from the people and uh, multilateral and interagency uh, operations. We can never do that without the support from uh, you people, all of us here, and of course, uh, to the civilians. You know. uh, during that time, you know, uh, it was a census that 
the AFP garnered almost a 75% net trust rating or satisfaction, meaning to say the people believe in our cause. That's why they are supporting us. Now, these are just uh, some of my takeaways for, uh, for you. you know? uh, something probably uh, you might be interested to know lessons I learned in my 38 years uh, in the service. Number one is uh, taking charge. When you are put in a situation that would call your leadership or your competence, you have to take charge or take responsibility or do something about it. Of course, uh, taking charge means you should be very visible in the battlefield. You should show this uh, positive attitude even at odds, you should exhibit that determination to prevail, you know, even in the most desperate situations. And you should have this uh, will to win. You know. It's always positive, will to win in your words, in your actions, the tone of your voice, you know, your appearance when you visit the battlefield. You know. When you visit the battlefield, you will see there, you, you will smell the smoke you will hear the wailing of the wounded and the uh, dead, uh, dead uh, troops uh, piled. But these are just normal. There should be at any instance that uh, the troops would feel that you are uncertain of the things that you are doing. So remember that. It's about being positive always. Second is uh, lead from the front. Best combat leaders have one thing in common, and that is leading from the front, sharing the burden with the troops, and you should not spare for yourself from what they are, from what they are uh, doing. You know? A good combat leader places himself alongside with, with his soldiers, you know? and uh, putting yourselves alongside with your soldiers will give your troops an added strength because they know that you are part of it. So that is uh, leading at the front. No? Third one is uh, keep the presence of mind. In the heat of the battle, sometimes your mind tends to lose its balance because too many things to confront you, your soldiers, no? the enemies, sometimes uh, unexpected setbacks and faults, criticism from your, uh, criticism even from your friends, from your colleagues. If that thing happens, you have to keep, it is vital to keep your uh, presence of mind. You have to keep that mental power. You, know? you have to resist the uh, emotional pull of the moment by being, by acting very decisive and very confident. You have to detach yourself from the chaos of the battle. Let others you know, roll their head, but you have to detach yourself from the chaos of the, of the battle so that you could decide. Second one, fourth one is uh, try new approaches. Our enemies are thinking. They are smart. They are sophisticated. So it requires different approaches, different perspective, and probably different, uh, different uh, mindset. There is no cookbook solution in any, in any problem. I remember during some Buanga seeds, uh, in the last day, some, uh, some 100 uh, enemies were grouped together in one tall building. So they didn't mind whether they are being fired uh, or something. But there was one game changer I did there, which they never expected. And that is, I used tear gas. You know, in the Philippines, we never use tear gas in operation. Also, these terrorists never knew how to address the tear gas. So when I used the tear gas, you know, at that instant, 82 terrorists came out of the open holding their guns and surrender. So that, that approach is something very new, something very new to them that they do not know. They didn't know how to address the tear gas. Actually, addressing the tear gas is just soaking your 
soaking your t-shirt and then putting it this. So it's very easy. You know? It's always best uh, good combat leaders observe the uh, uh, elements of surprise. And the last one is taking care of your man. Man. Some soldier says that taking care of your men is simply providing them good accommodations, good food, and probably good rest, good weapons and ammunition, which they could use in fighting. But uh, I believe taking care of your men is more than that, is more than that. You have to get out from your comfort zones. You have to talk to your personnel at the battlefield. Ask them how they are doing. Ask their concerns. Recognize their uh, small successes. Advise them to be very cautious in their work. Advise them to have a physical fitness. Ask their families how they are doing. These are the things that uh, will let them feel that they are never left alone in the battle. And I will tell you, if you are not leaving your, person, your, your troops, you know, during the darkest situations, when you look at your back, you still have followers there. You are, you are a leader. That in brief are uh, some, of the, uh, some lessons I learned in uh, the battlefield. I hope uh, we internalize this. And a pleasant afternoon to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so at this time, we've got about 20 minutes still for a question and answer. Uh, so please feel free. I'll walk around with the microphone. Uh, anywhere from you know, that uh, historical analysis of what you just learned about Marawi uh, to the case studies that John mentioned uh, to the events that kind of led up to Marawi during the reduction of uh, forces from the U.S. side uh, to coal or you know, tactical, additional tactical insight uh, from uh, Undersecretary Pomonik. So without further ado, do I have first question? Sir. <clears throat> Gentlemen, thanks for coming out to talk to us today. Uh, quick, you mentioned uh, across the board there's a lot of different uh, facets to, that led to Marwawi happening in the first place. Um, what's being done to uh, kind of prevent that from happening again? Anything from infrastructure, um, lawlessness, uh, the uh, bans, like, wh what's, what's the next step for, for the country either internally or with international help? Sir, do you want to yes. start? Yes. Okay. yes. Uh, that is one of the primary concerns of our president, and that is the building and rehabilitation of uh, Marawi. But uh, up to now, the internally displaced persons who are transited at the evacuation area could still never go back at, their, at the battleground because of so many IEDs there and so many unexploded uh, uh, ordinance. We have money, the Philippines, through the donations of different countries, uh, support from different nations have money, but still reconstructions inside the main battle areas is yet to be seen. Yeah. Although there were reconstructions outside and adjacent, but not inside the main battle area. So it's still, uh, it's still uh, a long way to go, the way I see it. And uh, we really pity those uh, evacuees who are at the uh, evacuation center. So I guess uh, quickly from my perspective, the internal conflicts in the Philippines and the southern Philippines have been going on for actually centuries, but kind of actively fighting in this framework for several decades. Um, what I think made Marawi so different than some of the other things we had seen up to this point was kind of the increased unity that we had seen from some of these kind of uh, terrorist groups, as well as their ability to kind of draw resources, as well as inspiration and radicalization from ISIS. So as far as kind of what some of the next steps can be, I would argue one of the key things we have to do is kind of focus on decreasing the radicalization, especially now that we have four or 500,000 displaced people uh, we know the top sources of radicalization in most cases are things like refugee camps, prisons, universities. 
So it would be trying to limit the number that are gonna take up arms and kind of continue that trend. And then the other part of that is kind of the physical cutting off of supplies, financing, things like that, to try and really break uh, the tie between, you know, now that the central caliphate is gone, it doesn't really have, you know, um, a geographic center, but certainly the ideology is still there. So how do we kind of break that ideology? How can we limit some of the external ties, not just to the Middle East, places like Syria, but some of the neighboring states, Malaysia, Indonesia. Um, so I think trying to decrease the number of potential you know, ISIS fighters uh, who are kind of becoming more and more radicalized. One of the things uh, in our class yesterday that Major Siasen had brought up, for the first time in the Philippines this year, they experienced suicide terrorism. Yes. That had never reached Twice. the Philippines. Twice, yep, exactly, twice. So that had never happened in the Philippines before. So we're seeing kind of not only the export of physical support, but kind of the change in tactics and change in ideology and radicalization. So I think until we kind of understand that that is a trend that's still happening mm. in 2019, and we kind of put a lot of efforts into stopping that, there's great potential for you know, another major incident happening. Go ahead, John. So I, I'll reword the question. Um, for my studies, which is how do you prevent another Mawari? Um, if you look at all trends, um, conflict is, has moved to urban areas. Um, whether any military recognizes that and, and prioritize that is a big conversation. But all global trends of pop, rapid population growth, urbanization, and littoralization, and connectedness, right? David Kilcullen's four mega trends have, have actualized. Um, to where the conditions that allow a Mawari or a Raqqa or a, whatever the conditions are, these um, major cities that are unable to secure themselves or address grievances such to the fact that violence, uh, internal violence increases to the level of conflict, both internally and then regionally, I predict will continue to happen. And, and one of the reasons is um, just in the, the every nation facing these geopolitical conditions. And we visited um, Mumbai recently, where you have million person slums. Um, and, and, that, and that income disparity could be normal across many major cities, but there's been a change where something is triggering, whether it's connectedness with, within your diasporas or different factions, the diffusion of the tactic that this will achieve some type of political gains, this ability to quickly seize a city and make, or parts of a city. If you look across Mexico, you look in other parts of Latin America, you look across the Middle East, this is going to continue. And, and one of the reasons I think that it's going to continue is because we can't combat it. If you look across 1970, urban terrorism and the act of small terrorist groups trying to get on the international stage was a, exploded. Um, it wasn't just the Munich Games, it was, a, it was a hijacking of airlines, it was, it was multiple occasions. And we developed a capability to quickly stamp that out. So the development of uh, special forces that could penetrate any area and intelligence driven and eliminate a threat. So I think until we as, a, as nation states can quickly stamp out an urban siege, it will continue because it is highly lucrative um, to both radicalize the, the oppressed in these cities, um, which will continue to happen because of unstable uh, urbanization, but also the fact that this, this tactic is cheap and exportable. Because, and a military has not developed a solution in order to quickly stamp it out, whether that's internal security with urban policing tactics, um, but to be able to contain that and stamp it out without creating nine months sie sieges in Mosul, five months sieges here, until we as a military force giving political leaders policy options, th I think this will continue. Because you saw the, the rapid decline of urban terrorism after the development of specialized capabilities. I think you're going to continue to see city sieges like this using all the, the, the trends of all these. I mean, you. There are many places across the globe where this is going to happen, in my opinion. So I'll offer up two things, and then uh, I'll pass it over to the next question. The first one is to dogpile on this, um, you know, the, the concept that it's difficult to combat. So it is cheap from the adversary side. It's cheap and exportable. In addition to the fact that, you know, 
from the external perspective, the use, the TTP uh, of suicide bombing in the Philippines is absolutely alarming because uh, it goes against the very fabric of the culture there. Um, but what is more alarming to me is that though the first two instances included females. That's something that's normal in the US military. It's what we see on the news. You hear it in the sit reps and the intel reports. That is not normal in, in the Philippines. Um, so in order to combat that, uh, you have to make it not cheap, which is difficult to do because of porous borders and the difficulty in maintaining that security. Uh, and then you have to prevent the export of it, which, brother, I, I don't know how to do that because that, that implies that tactical task of contain, which is resource heavy on the U.S. side or on the partner side. And at least within, within the U.S., when you've got competing threat priorities as dictated by the national security strategy, counterterrorism, you know, by virtue of that functional or, or that, uh, that baseline document, is going to lose out you know, in those decision-making cycles when, they, when our decision-makers have to decide where we allocate a resource. Is it going to go to a near-peer peer threat, or is it going to go to counterterrorism? Uh, and then the second piece in terms of what external is doing, so I'll, I'll speak from the embassy side of the house, uh, and I'll highlight kind of what the PSYOP uh, and public affairs does. Uh, so the U.S. Embassy has what we call the whole of government approach, which mirrors the whole of nation approach. Uh, in the Philippines, specifically two interagency partners on the U.S. side, uh, Department uh, of Justice uh, provides programmatic efforts uh, that um, include training uh, as well as advisement when it comes to the justice and legal system within the Philippines. Uh, so creating that formal infrastructure so that when the AFP under martial law or the Philippine National Police uh, during regular peacekeeping operations uh, peace and stability operations, as they detain and prosecute uh, an individual, that individual isn't hanging out in prison for a long period of time subject to radicalization. The second is Department of State. So within the Department of State, the public affairs section partners with uh, the U.S. PSYOP teams uh, to pursue those counter-radicalization programs. So even though our efforts kind of declined as dictated by uh, DOD during that time frame, State Department's efforts to do those counter-radicalization efforts within the prisons uh, still maintained its course. Um, so with that, uh, any other questions? Sir. Thanks, gentlemen. This question's for your undersecretary. Sir, I'm wondering uh, if, if you could speak about whether or not there were any attempts to uh, negotiate a settlement or some type of ceasefire with the terror groups before, during, or after uh, the entirety of the siege. Thank you. Yes. Primarily, we do not uh, negotiate to the terrorists. That is uh, the guidance of the president. Uh, but uh, what we did was uh, talking with uh, the different stakeholders. So we had uh, several consultations and meeting with the different religious groups, especially with the, with the imams, especially with the business sectors in the area and those uh, others which would help mitigate the effect of, uh, the effect of war. So that uh, it seemed to be working because uh, as you could see, during that time, actually the Maute would want to prolong the fighting because during that time it was a, uh, uh, what do we call it? Yes, uh, what is there? No, no. They observe uh, Ramadan. So it was a time of Ramadan. They thought they would be able to secure the help of other terrorist groups. But none of these uh, terrorist groups able to support them. None of them has supported the uh, Maoti group because of the very effective uh, civil military operations that we have conducted uh, at the main battle area or at the adjacent area. So we try to win the uh, support of uh, the people. Next. Sir. I'll go to Max. So the uh, question for both of you, the general and John. Uh, you both said one word that both intrigued me. Well, you didn't say it, but you're about to. 
So could you tell us how the drones were being used yes. in the siege? And then, John, you were just at NTC last week, and could you compare and contrast? Uh, so I, you first, yeah. So I, um, you know, the use of off-the-shelf drones started populating in the early 2014 and surprised all militaries to include us. Um, both in the ability for, not just for ISR, but um, for the dropping of munitions on top of forces. So it's the first time that any military, um, especially the US military, has had to look up since the Korean War. Um, at the National Training Center, they try, they've started to replicate that um, to include drone swarms, which are uh, moving by themselves and self-directing. Um, um, so when you attack a city and NTC, they'll face drone swarms. Um, the, the practice, um, so it, it, it is a, and you know here within the Army Cyber Institute, within the Robotics Institute, this, it started in 2014, this almost similar IED counter action reaction race. Hobby drone, how do I shoot it down? Everything from sh shotguns to a falcon attacking it. Um, it it's, a, it's still continuing this race to combat it. Um, but it is a, again, an, because of the diffusion of civilian technology that can be weaponized. Um, uh, most initially just for ISR, just to know where you're at. Um, so they can see you, which to mm -hmm. me is crazy. In the urban environment, yes. the enemy, no matter who you are, can, has two advantages. You can't see them because we can't see through concrete yet. We can if we push something up against the wall. And two, they can see you coming because you're the attacker. And they can see you from a distance, but now they use drones, they can see you even yes. farther. And they know, um, so now it's a, a big conversation on, we have a smoking problem, as in we don't remember how to use smoke operations to cover, to conceal our operations. We gotta go back to deception operations, all that. But the straight answer, that they were using it primarily at NTC for ISR, because for some reason we can't figure out that ISIS drops mechanism at a distance. You know the Maute is known to be the smartest and uh, most sophisticated terrorist groups in, our, in the Philippines. That's why they have used drones. These are uh, quadcopter drones that could reach, uh, would, have, would have a reach of five kilometer and could stay there for, could hover for at least uh, 10 to 12 minutes. No? You know, one day when I woke up, I saw so many drones up there hovering, about 20 of them. All of them are colored white because uh, Drones could be easily procured commercially in our country, but most, if not all of them, are colored white. So you know what I did? So I told my men, all our drones shall be painted with, with dark ones. So the following day, when I woke up, so we saw the drones there flying. Some of them are dark colors, some of them are white. Those white belong to the enemies, and those dark drones, because we painted them beneath, belong to the uh, armed forces. So I ordered them to shoot all drones with white colors. Yes. Also, there was one story I would like to show you how we use drones in rescuing the hostages. See this one. Accidentally taken by the taken by our drones, they are the hostages. So that's this, this is day one. We plan on the following day. See, we attach the, we attach the cell phone. We connect it to the drone. We instruction there to cut with the blade, and the and and the cell phone has number. All they have to do is to ring it. What happened? We were able to communicate with the hostages, and during that night time. We rescued 18 hostages because of the uh, because of the drones. So they were the hostages whom we talked. You know? So 18 of them during night time we, we, we were able to rescue. Sure. All right. So I'll I'll go to last question to Max. Gentlemen, mine's a pretty open question for any of you. Um, on one of the challenges slides, you guys mentioned the role of females in ISIS, and I was curious if you could expand on that a little bit, specifically about how they contribute to the war effort 
as well as talking about how do you reintegrate them after the fighting's over, assuming that you know they're not killed as a as collateral damage during it. I'll go first. Very simple. Yeah. Yes. During uh, the Battle of Marawi, the women who were radicalized were used for uh, non-combatants. They were used seemed to be like nurses caring for the wounded, cooking for the food, and preparing for everything. But you know, after Battle of Marawi, they tend to become more hostile. There were two incidents, as uh, Major Siosan had uh, earlier said, that they used these female suicide bombers. One is uh, last January this year, inside the uh, Catholic Church in Kulo. So he, she exploded herself, that killed uh, 23, 23 uh, civilians no? and uh, dozens of uh, wounded. And the last time was uh, just two months ago, last September. No? So these women passed on to the uh, military checkpoints and suddenly he was accosted by uh, military officers. So what she did, she pulled and then she exploded. So it seemed to be that when male terrorists seem to be unsuccessful in his tasks or missions, sometimes they opted to use this female, uh, female terrorist, like the two, the two incidents I, I mentioned. So I think that's a, it's a great question, uh, and just what I'll say briefly. We know studying several insurgencies and terrors, uh, terrorist movements, one of the most important aspects to combating it in the long term is having a successful demobilization campaign. Uh, that's something that I think we are struggling with, not only in the Philippines, I think in a lot, of, a lot of the Middle East as well. One of the things that makes some of those campaigns successful is having specifically tailored programs that's specific to their culture and their economy to not only try and de-radicalize people, but get them reintegrated back into their kind of, what types of jobs they're able to take up in their country, what types of jobs are specific to those populations in that country. Uh, one of the few things you know, that comes to mind we did in the Philippines when it came, uh, we weren't dealing with female suicide terrorists or anything at this point, but we did start to see some radicalization amongst female populations. So we actually had kind of a female empowerment speaker series that went around different parts of Mindanao where we had started to detect kind of radicalization amongst female populations, and it would be led by kind of key female leaders that were successful in a range of industries to try and kind of reach out and bridge some of those gaps. So I think when you're, when you're looking at these programs, uh, whether it's in the Philippines or, or really anywhere, it's kind of key to have speakers and have engagement specific to those populations to help kind of reintegrate them. Yeah, don't leave this, this talk thinking this is a tactical problem. This is a strategic mm -hmm. problem of being able to use force or a threat of force to achieve a policy goal. Um, political leaders had few options, and they tried multiple of them to include, right, what's, what's decisive victory, bringing the other party to the, the political table. Um, if you have no other options, then you lead to this force uh, destroying your city to save it, and that plays into other options. And I could argue to you in all the battles of Iraq, that option that the military gives the policymaker then restricts their future decisions. And then you see besieged cities le being left besieged for two years because of the capabilities the political leader currently has. And I'll close basically again dogpiling on what Cole said about a program specific uh, to that demographic and that culture. I'll share a very quick story that I'm sure many veterans are familiar with, uh, and it's the well story in Afghanistan. Um, so there was this initiative that we'd be, we would build well, we, America, would build wells in these villages uh, to, you know, allow easier access to water. Um, as these wells were built in this one specific village, uh, we found that it kept being destroyed, you know, as soon as it was built. And it wasn't until later on that we figured out that the well was disrupting uh, the female villagers' um, pattern of living, if you will. They appreciated the opportunity to walk all the way down to the river uh, because that was their time away from the men. It was their time to socialize. Uh, and when we came in to build those wells, it, uh, it created a lot of grievances from them because we, we essentially took that time away. Uh, so that is simply an analogy, but you know, when, when you're in that position to decide you know, how to 
how to manage that problem uh, of de-radicalization de and demobilization. It has to be specific to that culture. Uh, so without further ado, I, I thank you again for your, uh, for, your, for your time. Thanks to the panels. I appreciate the support from Vios, as always, uh, and uh, the, Cook the Coke Foundation, again, for uh, sponsoring this specific event. So please, round of applause to my panelists. Thank you. Thanks so much.